Today's book is On Filmmaking by Alexander McKendrick. Now, this book is an edited, compiled version of his notes from two of the classes he taught at the California Institute of the Arts, Dramatic Construction and Film Grammar, or How Narratives Can Be Written and How Narratives Can Be Filmed. I say can be and not should be, but his advice, while earnest and serious, isn't prescriptive. In fact, uh, two examples he gives in his preface, one long-winded one about how Picasso mastered painting before revolutionizing the form, and another, more succinctly put, a demolition expert has to understand every principle of architecture before he can do his job. Let us then, as McKendrick encourages, put aside your hunger for instant gratification and creativity at least long enough to understand some basic ideas and practical pieces of advice that you are perfectly entitled to discard later. Let's dig in. Alexander McKendrick became the Dean of the Film School at CalArts after making nine feature films, five for Ealing Studios in England and four in the Hollywood system in America. His most famous films, or at least the films that I was familiar with before beginning this project, are in order of release, Whiskey Galore, The Man in the White Suit, The Lady Killers, and Sweet Smell of Success. To wildly oversimplify a man's entire life and perspective, McKendrick had decided that he had had enough of life as a freelance Hollywood director to quote, I found that in order to make movies in Hollywood, you have to be a deal maker. I realized I was in the wrong business and got out. McKendrick was appointed the Dean of the Film School at CalArts, and after helming the film school for almost a decade, he stepped down as Dean to focus on teaching, where he remained a professor at CalArts until his death in 1993. The book is an edited and annotated compilation of McKendrick's notes from two of the classes he taught. As a result, the intended audience of this book is, ideally, a film student, specifically a student of directing. But the appreciative audience may be any film fan who has a particular appreciation of craft. They, in fact, may get a, a kick out of the second half of this book on film grammar. The first half of this book, on dramatic construction, will also find an appreciative audience for anybody interested in writing or in dramaturgy. Paul Cronin, the editor of this book, has also written an interview book with Werner Herzog and a book documenting a series of workshops with Abbas Kiarostami. McKendrick's writings tackle craft, structure, and precision. Herzog aims his attention at the value of perseverance and what he calls agitation of the mind. Kiarostami focuses on the expression of poetry, on the potency of reading between lines, on the search for the enigmatic. If Herzog is a self-proclaimed soldier of cinema, McKendrick is a mechanic, and Kiarostami a monk. If you like approaching films by cracking them open and seeing how they work, this book's probably for you. The book's division into two parts reflects the two classes that he taught and the notes from each, uh, dramatic instruction and film grammar. Uh, and it's no surprise, based on both McKendrick's writings and Cronin's editorial decisions, that dramatic instruction is longer and comes first. McKendrick really wants to focus on narrative and story before engaging in, in what he calls the delights of the director. McKendrick is interested in how you can write, unpack, rearrange, strengthen, and refine a narrative before you begin applying that story you've created to any particular medium. One of the larger chapters that anchors the first half of the book is Exercises for the Student of Dramatic Instruction. It's the largest chapter in the ongoing discussion of dramaturgy that takes up the first half of the book, and it offers several examples of what to do when writing and when rewriting your story. Another large and substantive chapter is Density and Subplots in Sweet Smell of Success. McKendrick describes watching one of the screenwriters of the movie take one of the scenes and add texture and depth to the scene without substantively changing it so that it still fits inside the larger narrative. McKendrick then compares one scene from first draft to final draft. So what changes? Well, a lot, but here's one interesting example. There's multiple instances of what McKendrick calls triangulation. Person A is speaking to person B, but it's really for person C's benefit. Here's one small example when press agent Sidney Falco runs into an unimportant client he's trying to avoid. Now what do you do for that hundred a week? Fall out of bed? Jimmy, I was just on my way inside to talk to Hunter. I got a great... I have this kid arrested for larceny. Listen, when the band was at Rose Lane, I was the that one was that... two months ago. Jimmy. Take your hands out of Jimmy. my pocket, thief. Jimmy, now take it easy, Why? Jimmy. It's a dirty job, but I pay clean money for it, don't no I? No more, you don't. What is this? Showing off for the girl he's supposed to hear you in Korea? Uh, he's clever. He knows when he's being fired. 
By having Welkin address to his girlfriend lines that are meant for his press agent, Odette is effectively using her to bounce lines. A bigger example stretches over two scenes. Press agent Sidney Falco is in front of his club because he's trying to get access to gossip columnist J.J. Hunsecker, functionally a power broker around whom much of the narrative revolves. Senators try to sit at his table, and Sidney Falco wants a moment of his time, without earning his ire. First he asks, then he barges in, gambling that both the information he has and a solution he can offer J.J. is worth risking J.J. Hunsecker's wrath. He is initially rejected. Could I come in for a minute? And so, when he sees another, similar rejection only moments later, he decides to needle Hunsaker indirectly by talking to the senator instead. Billy, you're not following the column. I had it last week. Senator, do you believe in capital punishment? Why? A man has just been sentenced to death. McKendrick describes this as adding density to the scene, and that's a great way to phrase it. It's the opposite of bagginess, almost. Falco and Hunsaker's battle of wits has a little bit more shape to it, and while the scene doesn't run particularly longer than the earlier draft of the scene, provided complete in the book, Falco still manages to have more meaningful and interesting interactions with other people at the table while also interacting with JJ. McKendrick runs through more examples than just triangulation, however. Like the rest of the book, the examples in this section are concrete, but I still feel like I could apply them to my own writing. This chapter alone may be worth the price of admission for some, but there are other equally illuminating chapters. Take, for example, the location breakdowns, and you will find one of the best parts of this book, McKendrick's handouts. Originally class handouts, now simply visual diagrams that come along with the book to illustrate his points. They are a phenomenal resource throughout the book. The iterative consideration of blocking is a lecture by itself, just contained in the handouts. Take a look at this. This walks you from accepting the layout of the room as given, to rearranging the furniture and looking for depth of composition, to considering how to block the actors to minimize setups. Easily one of the biggest draws for me is the visual component of this book. Several of the handouts from these two classes compiled here within. It's really phenomenal. And the illustrations aren't just in the film grammar section. In the dramatic construction section, he provides a character network, or a character web as he calls it, illustrating not just the characters themselves, but the relationships and their relative strength and importance to the narrative. Easily a concept that you or I could apply to any story we're writing, be it play or novel or film. This is the structure of most of the book. Sometimes it'll be his thoughts on a subject or an analysis of a particular narrative, but often enough it will be McKendrick presenting a problem. It could be how to unpack and rewrite a story, or how to explore a location, but it could be how to coach an actor without them feeling like they're being handled, or how to approach a problem on set that you didn't realize until the day you arrived and not any time during prep. And for each of these problems, he explains his thought process uh, and how to solve the problem from the perspective of an experienced director. It never feels pandering or overly obvious, and when it does feel obvious, he phrases it in a way that makes it seem like, oh, he's simply explaining an idea that I could have come up with on my own. This idea is in fact how McKendrick ends the book by saying that his perspective on education, if you were to look at it linguistically, is that it is to lead out of what? Well, to either lead somebody out of ignorance, or to lead a good idea out of a student so that they feel like they came up with it on their own. So this is a phenomenal resource, and I'm using that word specifically, a phenomenal resource. In addition to the many interesting passages, only a few of which I highlighted here, McKendrick also constantly references other texts, from Aristotle's Poetics to William Archer's 1912 treatise On Playmaking, treading over much of the same ground that he treads here in On Filmmaking, but albeit in a slightly more dated manner. He revisits it and explains his thoughts. On top of that, there are several other references that he makes, smaller quotes or citations, that are painstakingly cited in the margins by Paul Cronin. Paul Cronin has done a marvelous work editing and compiling this book. His website is in the description below where you can find longer and different handouts that didn't make the cut here. But this book is filled to the brim with references already. Well, that's all for this episode. If you have recommendations for what to read next, drop them in the comments. Now be nice down there. Until then, Always more to read, always more to learn, always more to do. As McKendrick himself says, process, not product. It'll be a lifetime of reading. Thank you for watching.